Okay. Welcome to Physics 3A. Hopefully you're in the right room. Um, this is Physics 3A, uh, and I am Professor Dannon. There's my email address. Uh, today we're going to start by going through a few administrative details, and then get started right in with the class. We only have 10 weeks, and in the pre-quiz, many of you expressed concern about the course going too fast, so we'll just start out really fast so you can get over that worry. Yes, it goes too fast. Um, so some basic administrative features. One, I would like to point out, um, this class is being videotaped. Uh, and some of, the, some of it will get posted for you. Uh, you'll still need to come, unfortunately, because you can't get clicker question credit over the video. Uh, what that does mean, though, is I will be doing a lot of demos, and occasionally I need help from you, the studio audience, I mean the class. And so you will get a strange email from me requesting that you sign a waiver. I, I know it's, it's always like everybody always wants to be involved in the demos, and I always have thousands of people rushing up here really quick to do it. Uh, so this is even more inspiration to do it. You'll get like memorialized forever on video in like 3A for the rest of your life. So if nothing else happens, you know, you'll be a demo person in Physics 3A, and you can put that on your CV. <laughs> It gets you jobs, trust me. Um, other administrative details. Discussion section does start this week. And, and yes, I know it's horrible, but you must attend the discussion you registered for. That's administrative point one. Now. Many people ask me, is discussion required? You know, nothing in this course is required, but there are points for it. So uh, you can decide whether it's required or not. I mean, you're not even required to take the exams or final. It just has a negative impact on your grade. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff that happens in discussion, but because of the number of students and the amount of stuff that happens in the planning, if you start going to other discussions, it is unfortunate just take seats away from students who actually were able to get registered for those. I know various people may or may not have special cases. I have no authority to grant you a waiver or to get you in. Neither do the TAs. Um, you need to go see the physics department undergraduate office, Eileen Powell. I'll get that information on the website. I mean, if you really need to switch and you're desperate, keep in mind this course is scary enough that a lot of people do drop after the first week. <laughs> so there's always a chance spots will open up if you're quick, so pay attention. But yeah, I, you can beg, plead, bribe. Um, None of that will work. I can't get you into a different discussion section. But you do have to attend. It, you know, as with everything in life, if you sneak into the wrong one, we're probably not going to notice. But that also probably means you won't get your grade, because we won't notice. Um, we, you know, the TAs have their rosters for the ones. And they don't, you know, it's too confusing with 300 students to keep track of everybody moving around. So it probably won't happen. Now, the other thing in my class when I teach that often causes undue stress. If you've read the syllabus, you will see that there is a fixed grading scale. I do not grade on a curve. Um, I firmly believe that all of you can get an A. And if you all earn it, I'm more than happy to give it to you. Um, so I don't restrict it to just the top 15%. Uh, so you just need to get an 85%. And you're guaranteed an A minus, no matter what, or better. Um, and so you can look at the web. It's 85% for an A minus, 70% for a B minus, 55% for a C minus. So plan accordingly, whatever grade you want, that tells you how many points you need to get. Um, I do reserve the right, if by some weird chance I screw up, and I've been doing this for 16 years, and something turns out to be too hard, I reserve the right to lower those numbers, but it is an absolute guarantee I will never raise them. And what that means is help each other, work together, make sure you do what it takes to succeed in the class, because like I said, I'll give as many A's, B's, and C's as people earn. Um, I have, have absolutely no problem with that. That being said, the course is designed for success. I, I often get the comments from students who take my classes. It's a lot to keep track of. There's the pre-lecture quiz. There's the clicker questions in class. There's the discussion sections assignment. There's the homework. There's three one-hour exams, one of them on the last day of 10th week, you may have noticed. And then there's the final. Uh, I've been, again, I've been doing this for 16 years. I've taught 3A more times than I care to admit or count. Um, it, this is not just like to annoy you. 
There is nothing in this class designed to annoy you. It's all there because I know the students that do it tend to do very well. That's the way it's set up. Um, just if you notice, the stuff that's designed to practice and learn is 20% of your grade. If you go on the website and do the math, the exams are 80%. That does mean if you want to meet my 85% cutoff, you have to do at least some of the practice or the best you can do is a B. I'm just doing that math for you outright since some of you said math was the part you were most worried about. Uh, so there, you get, you get you know, a, a step up to begin with. Um, the other thing about it, though, is, like I said, it all has a purpose. There are the lecture pre-quizzes. Most of you got the first practice quiz. Uh, some of you are already panicked about quiz one due Wednesday because things have gone wrong. You get a break. Please, please go take quiz one. Don't skip it after I say this. But week one is kind of like a bye week. None of these points count on the quizzes because I know everyone's getting used to it. However, they do count as extra credit at the end. Those of you who actually take quiz one for Wednesday and do well, you get those points. It just doesn't penalize anyone. Um, why do I do the pre-quiz? This makes sure you actually know stuff in the book that I'm never going to say in lecture. Uh, there's a textbook. I don't have to repeat it. I'm sorry, that's not my job is to stand up here and read the textbook for you. So there is stuff in the textbook you need to read ahead of time and know and get it from the textbook. And I'm going to come in here and lecture, assuming you know it. The pre-quiz is both for you and for me to make sure that we know it. Uh, maybe it just turned out that it was really hard and nobody got it from the textbook. Then I'll do it in lecture. Likewise, the clicker questions in class are a chance to think in real time. So you get to think about the stuff I'm talking about. I get to see what you're thinking. And in both of these will benefit you and they also benefit me because it allows me to know if we're way off course or not. Uh, I can't really help you if I don't know what you don't know. That sentence actually made sense. Um, so those are those parts. That's why they're there. The, the stuff that's really, really for you is the discussion exercises and the homework. The great thing about the discussion, again, this gives you real-time feedback. One of the things you'll see I do that I'll get to in a moment is I actually require you to explain what you did on the test for half the questions. Roughly half the questions, all you got to do is get the right answer. Um, it's a new thing for many of you. If you don't practice it in discussion, you won't be able to do it on the test. That's just the way it works. Uh, the other thing I really encourage you to do is we don't force it on you in discussion if you're like the lone wolf who loves to do everything all by yourself. We're not going to force you to actually talk to other human beings. <laughs> but it's the best way to do it. So in discussion, make sure you're in a group. Make sure you're working together, helping each other. Because again, it doesn't hurt you any to help someone else because there's no curve. right? It only helps you because then you get to practice explaining it. So it's a great thing to do. Homework, um, hopefully everyone has figured out mastering physics by now. It's all online. It's graded online. You get the immediate feedback. There will be two types of assignments. Right now, you've only seen the homework assignment. I've opened up a homework assignment. I'm not counting the, the practice one. The practice one is just, if you've never used it, tells you how to push the buttons and how to enter stuff and all that. I will also put up just practice assignments. And they will be clearly labeled practice assignments. And it's all totally up to you if you want to do them but it gives you a chance to have a whole bunch of other problems where you get that immediate answer, you get the hints, and they're good things to practice. I also, if I push the right buttons and someone should tell me if it's not working, when the assignment closes, you can go back and do it as many times as you want. It'll give you the problems again to practice. You just won't get graded for it. It stays open so you can practice it all the way past the exams. And then final, the big one that everybody loves, I have three exams during the quarter, and then the final. Now, many times, by the end of the quarter, you'll all love the fact that I give three exams. Right now, you're probably hating it. Uh, but I, you know, people always, that's the favorite thing. They always write that the highest of the course. So you can just go ahead and know now you'll check that as the best thing when you get to the end of the evaluation. But it means you get to learn what you don't know. Right? I mean, that's important. You would like to, when you study for the final, study the stuff you're lousy at. 
So you're better at it, so you do well, right? Most of you? Because I asked what you want to get out of this course, and many of you would like an A. That was what you put. A, a fair answer. Um, some of you, I think, were just desperate to pass. That's also a fair answer. But if you don't know what you don't know, you can't study it. So by the end of the quarter, as you go to the final, you will have an exam on everything that will show up on the final. And it, it'll be nicely chunked. There's three sections of this class. It works out really well. And you can go back. If you got like an A on the first one and an A on the last one, but a D on the middle one, guess what you should be studying? You know, you're all asleep. It's right after lunch. You've lost it. Okay, you got an A on the first, an A on the last, and a D in the middle one. Which exam should you study the hardest? No. Good. See, you've got a chance of doing well in the course. So that's the three exams. And then the final just covers everything. And that's pretty much the class. Any questions? Yes? Are the two exams um, cumulative or not? No, no. Each, well, yes and no. OK, physics is cumulative, right? But the exams aren't explicitly so. Um, but you know, we'll learn about energy. And to do kinetic energy, you need to know what velocity is, which is what we learned in the first week. So you can't do it without knowing that, but it's, it's, the problems are pretty much on that. So yes and no. Any other questions? Yes? Do you have to get the clicker questions right to get the points? No. And you don't, you don't even quite have to answer all of them. I think it's like 80% you have to answer to get credit for it. So if, if you fall asleep for like 10 minutes in class and you miss one, you're OK. <laughs> do you get analyzed or quizzes? Do you get lost? Uh, OK, on the online quizzes, because I allow you to use your book, your friend, um, your, you know, your parent, if you call them out of desperation, if they know anything, uh, you do get penalized if you get it wrong. Um, but, but use your book, use your friend. The quizzes is the one part of the course where you really should just try your best to get it right by whatever means necessary. That's not cheating on the online quizzes. Make sense? I should have said that. That's a great question. So w one good way to do the online quizzes, since they're not timed either, is to start it and have your book there. And just, you know, you're not sure, go through the book and find the answer. And you'll see some of the answers, like there's always a question. If you tell me what's the hardest thing that's causing you the most trouble now, you'll see that's usually worth one point. You can't get that one wrong if you actually answer it. <laughs> if you fail to answer it, you can. So. I, other questions? Yes? Um, is, the, is the actual textbook you assign necessary to pass the class, or can we use a physics book you already have? Oh, you can use one you already have, because the nice thing is just, just find the chapters that match, um, because the, the homework is all through Mastering Physics. And that's, you do have to, unfortunately, somehow get access pay for Mastering Physics. Either you can do it as a standalone, or you can do it bundled with the book. But yeah, there's nothing in the course that relies on that particular textbook, except that the one you have has the same basic material. And they all do. You'll just have to find where it is. These are great questions. Any more? Yes? Are the online questions similar to the ones that will be on your test? Not at all. <laughs> Not even close. Um, <laughs> And the main reason is the online quiz ones are all multiple choice, and they all tend to be mostly concepts or very, very simple calculations to kind of see are we in the right space to go forward. The exam is all just problems. There's no conceptual questions on the exam, except that you need to know the concepts to do the problems. Now, nah, there's like a teeny penalty. I think it's like 3% per try. It's small. I, I think that's what it is. I forget the exact. There's, there's a slight penalty for that. Oh, big thing I forgot. No one's asked. All exams are completely closed book. You don't even get a formula sheet. Oh, yeah. But wait, trust me. It's better that way. I'll, I'll get into that. Um, hey, I, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm good. I know how it works. A anything else? Yeah. Um. You know, you don't really need one on the exams. It's a little useful. I mean, there's some trig, you know, but it turns out all angles in physics are 30 or 60 degrees and occasionally 45. <laughs> so those of you, see, you can tell who knows their trig. They just laughed at that joke. Um, laughing at my jokes does give you extra credit because we are being taped. Um, anything else? 
Okay, so let's let's get moving. Um, the the big thing, by the way, is you know all of this is pretty much on the web and in the syllabus, and. One of the secrets to physics, this is the sad thing, people get all worried about the math. Nobody checked really in their, in their concerns reading. One or two people kind of got close to that. Reading is the number one problem and the number one reason people fail physics is they just can't read. It, that's just what it turns out to be. You have to read these stupid problems I write because I write in a weird, co complicated way. And you know, you've got to be able to read the problem and figure out what I want. Now let me ask you, how many of you still have hopes of going to some sort of medical profession broadly defined? You know, it could be dental, could be you know, orthopedic, physical therapy, right? Yeah, oh, you're such a hopeful group, yes. <laughs> um, pharmacy, right? What, what do you have to deal with? You deal with people who come in and say, you know, the other day I was like driving my car and then my dog barked and my elbow hurt, but then I was sitting this way and it was actually my eye, but then I think it was my finger and then I sat down, but then I stood up and then I was jumping and the sky was blue. What's wrong with me? Right? And so out of all of this information, you got to figure out what is actually wrong with them. That is why I write really confusing problems. Right? So you can practice being a medical person and reading really confusing statements and figuring out what's going on. Now, it's not quite that bad. I'm not as bad as the average patient. But you do have to, in life, learn to extract information, whatever profession you end up in, even if it's not medical. You have to recognize in a situation what is the actual key information that's going to make me successful here. Some of you have wrote in your, what you would like to get out of this is something that would actually apply to the real world. You may or may not use the physics we learn again. You actually may, some of it. But what you will learn and what you will use is an ability to read and recognize in a situation what matters. And that is an absolute critical skill. There's nothing that doesn't need that. So that's number one, read the rules carefully. The other thing is, if we go, uh, where's my, there. If we go down, to some of the comments on the pre-quiz where I asked, what's the greatest fear? These are actual some direct quotes, but let me tell you, there's 300 of you and you all almost said the same thing. Surprising, actually, number one, this is the first time I've seen this a lot. And it just goes to show you can do something for 16 years and still something new can happen. There are a lot of you who actually admitted to never having a physics class before. You're in luck, because um, you were not previously confused by a high school teacher. Good. <laughs> so, <laughs> I. And that's actually really mean of me. Both my mom and sister teach high school, and now my wife does too, so I really should not say anything negative about high school teachers. Um, memorizing all the formulas. Th I'm so nice. You have to do that, yes. But it's only like two sides of a page, and I give it to you at the beginning. If you go to the web page, I gave you all the formulas you need to succeed in this class. They're on the website. They're there. You can go memorize them tonight before anything else happens. Done. Good. Okay. I think it would be the math part. I, I like the confidence in what, you know, was going on here. Because a lot of people just wrote math. And that was it. Uh, yes, I, I will admit, how many of you last took calculus over a year ago? And that, I presume, was your last math class? Yeah. That, that is the tough part in this class. The math is the tough part. And I try to minimize that for that reason but also give you enough chance to practice it. The goal on the tests, really, is to minimize the amount of calculations and math you have to do so that time is not a problem. I do try to do that. So let's, I'll just say that we don't always succeed, but you want to practice your math. You've got to be refreshing yourself on it. Uh, we will use calculus in the course. I have no problem in lecture using derivatives and integrals. I, I tell the TAs to tell you, and I'll let you know, very rarely, I don't think I've ever given a test problem where you have to do an integral. Uh, it might be on the homework. It might be in discussion. But one of the reasons I use it a lot, every professor has their own philosophy. And it's very, very hard to do e and m the next quarter, 3b, without doing integrals. I don't really use them here in the, on the exams because I want to give you a chance to like, remind yourselves how to do that and get caught up. So we'll use them in class and stuff. Um, but practice them, even though they won't be on our test, you'll need them in the next class. So you might as well start practicing it now. So that's, for, for physics 3A, 
If you get really good at your trig, and that's why I asked that as one of the quiz questions, how do you feel about trig? Trig is the most important thing. You cannot do mechanics without being comfortable with sines and cosines and tangents. It just won't happen. Um, and so if you're not comfortable with it, either you know, seek me out, seek the TAs, go to office hours. Speaking of which, I forgot now, office hours will be Friday. I'm not sure which room yet, so you will get an email with that. Um, not understanding the concepts. This is one I've thought a lot about. Physics can be difficult this way. Uh, one of the things you, what makes it weird in physics is you have to just kind of split yourself into two. Accept what I tell you is true even if it makes no sense. And use it with confidence even if you don't understand it. And then eventually you will see and understand. You can actually, I, I shouldn't admit this out loud on camera, you can actually be successful without understanding anything I say if you just believe me. <laughs> That's not the best thing because it's hard to believe something you don't understand and you get nervous and you use it wrong. But in, in, a, in a sheer act of desperation, if you just say, I have no idea why, but Professor Denon said this, I'm going to do it, it'll probably work. Okay? But reaching comprehension in physics really ends up being about doing a bunch of practice problems. And everybody has their own level at which it suddenly makes sense. You know, it might make sense for you when you do one. It might make sense when you, for you when you do three. It almost never makes sense just reading them in the book or watching me. Until you actually do, it is the rare person who will understand my lecture right from the beginning. All of it. Except this part here where I'm just like waving my hands and chatting. Um, once we start doing physics, there will almost always be parts of lecture you don't understand and you need to go home and struggle with, work through, do the problems. And you know, next year you'll wake up one morning and you're like, oh! That's what he meant. I could have passed. Um, <laughs> so you, you want to keep that in mind, that, that really the understanding is a, a bit weird that way in, in a physics class. So what, what really happens? At the end of the day, this is about solving problems. And there's really two parts to that. There is getting the right answer. And there's explaining how you did it. And one way I could do the class is I could give you exams and say, you know, the only thing that matters is getting the right answer, no partial credit. Boom. Go do that. The other thing I could do is say, you know, the only thing that matters is your explanation and everything will be partial credit. What you'll find is, in fact, the exams are both. There's a bunch of questions where you just get credit for getting the right answer. We don't check your work. You either get it right, you get it wrong. And then there's always, on the, our exams, there's one. And on the final, there's two questions where you have to explain your answer. And if your explanation isn't good, even if you get the right answer, you will not get full credit. That's just the way it works. And we, you can go on the web and find it. We have this cool five box solution. And you know, the first thing you do when you meet a physics problem, I told you, is you have to read it and understand it. And then, and then basically describe the key elements. So in this top box, and you'll see this as I solve problems in class, I will be talking and thinking in these terms, and then I will often post the solution in a nice, neat format that actually shows the final solution. But the first thing you'll do is tell me the situation. You'll make sure you know what's going on. Are things moving? Are things flying? Are things at rest? Are there forces? Are there no forces? And then the next thing you really have to decide is what it is the question's actually asking you. Can't tell you how many times a student reads a problem, does a whole bunch of work, and doesn't actually answer the question. Particularly if the question is, Evil Knievel tries to jump over seven buses, does he make it? I often get an answer 10 meters. <laughs> <laughs> so when, and, and, uh, th this is like the easiest two points you'll ever get in your life. That's almost always worth two points to just tell me what do you have to find? Because the nice thing is I make you write the answer here. And like the really good students check that they match that the answer actually answers the question. Now, the other thing you have to be able to do is tell me what you did and why. And that's the part that we'll go over a lot, but that's the strategy. And the number one way to succeed in physics 
is never do anything unless you have a reason. Just, that's as, it's as simple as that. Do not take the next step unless you have a reason for taking it. And I will tell you this, and I'll say it over and over in this class, I teach you very little. There is not actually a lot in this class. It fits on two sides of a piece of paper. So one of you, your reason for doing anything has to come from those two sides of a piece of paper. Worst case scenario, you start at the top of the paper, try that, no, it doesn't work. Then you go next, it doesn't work, doesn't, and then you just go until one works. But only use the things from the piece of paper and make sure you have a reason. And then I give you space to do the fun part that you all like. This is where you do the math. And then you, it's helpful, like I said, to check your answer. Does it make sense with the question? So you will see this a lot. You'll see it in discussion section. This is the only week we won't be doing this in discussion section, but you'll have one next week. And there'll be examples on the web and different things like that. A any questions on this? And I can even just show you real quickly while you think if you have a question. So if you go to the course website um, and you go to important class information, you will see the two things I talked about. Here is the required concept sheet. And the only reason it takes up two pages is I actually include a lot of words to explain what they are. Um, it's actually less than that if you think about the actual stuff you need to know. And then this is the, and this will actually show up on every exam. And that is how you'll do the problems. I recommend, we don't require it for the online homework, but I recommend occasionally practice some of the homework problems by using the boxes. It's just a good practice. I also strongly recommend, anytime you're doing physics in this class, have this sheet with you and just note, what did I use from here? What did I use from here? What did I use from here? And if you're trying to use something that's not on here, why am I doing that? You know, did Professor Denon actually make a mistake? Probably not. Um, it's, it's, it's possible, but probably not. So that's, like I said, today is about telling you how to be successful, since many of you put that as your goal. Any other, any questions now at this point? Yes. Not at all. The strategy is your strategy. Um, I will tell you this. <laughs> occasionally students, we're, we're not dumb. We were students too. Occasionally students will try to write down every concept in the course as their strategy. <laughs> <laughs> you will get doc points at that point. Right? If you write down steps that you never even use and clearly are not related to the problem, you will lose points there. Um, we, do, we do dock you for what I call the brain core dump, where you just write down everything. Uh, but no, and, and it, what's even cooler? is if you pick a strategy that seems reasonable but doesn't actually work, you only like lose the points for getting the problem wrong and maybe it, it, like with the calculation or if you do the calculation all right, matching that strategy, you get full credit for the calculation, lose a point maybe in the strategy. So it really, it's actually a good way to do partial credit. It really benefits you a lot. And no, we don't penalize you for doing it differently than we do. Which leads to my next point. This is the one warning. I don't really like textbooks, <laughs> so I pay little attention to the textbook. The textbook <coughs> might say it a little differently than me. This is not meant to confuse you. This is to go to the point. There often is not one way to do a physics problem. And I actually view this as a benefit to you. If the textbook and myself and the TAs all present slightly different ways to do it, then you can pick the one that makes the sense to you. I am not going to make sense to all 300 of you. But between myself, the TAs, and the textbook, one of us will. And then you'll be able to know how to do it. So if you see me do it a certain way and the TA does something different and that makes so much more sense, do it that way. You're not going to get marked wrong for it. That's, that's the way to do it. If, you're, if you actually were one of the people who had a good high school teacher and they taught you something different than what we did, it works, do it. Use it. Use what it works. Um, and I already said this. Lecture will not always make sense, but that's okay. Um, it will eventually make sense. Keep in mind, notice what I do. And five of you will still complain about the end, but that's fine. Uh, 
I don't have nice, neat PowerPoint slides that I hand out. Uh, you don't get nice lecture notes from me. I will post, um, I'll, I'll save these, hopefully if it works, and, and try and post my notes. But as most students notice, I'm going to be scribbling all over them and drawing things and crossing stuff out and drawing funny lines. So don't rely on my notes as lecture notes. Uh, rely on your own crossed out, scribbled, drawn on notes. So now the fun part. We get to practice our first clicker question. So get out your clickers. Usually I get, you know, give you 30 seconds to a minute. Obviously I've been talking while you're doing it. Hopefully you all answered. Physics is a really hard subject that I have to take. My favorite subject, I have no idea what physics is. Um, the study of the interaction of objects in the physical world. No, we put up the answers. And as always, two of you managed to answer an answer that wasn't there. I just, I, I've never figured that out, but you know, it happens. Um, most of you went with the study of the interactions of objects in the physical world, which is what we'll be doing. This is a case where the others are not really wrong. Um, it is hard for some people. Um, you know, some people do really like it, and some people have no idea what it is. So this is a case where all of these um, would work. You know, at some level, this is the best answer. Now. One of the reasons I don't make you get these right or wrong, most of them will have a right answer. And this, this PowerPoint I will be posting after the lecture, which will have the question and then, and then the answer correct in red. Some of them will be like this, where really there's not one right answer, but there's one that I'm trying to highlight or that I like. Um, and again, that won't happen on the test that you'd get them because there's no multiple choice on the test anyway. Um, but that is something to be aware of. So hopefully everybody got theirs to work. Um, that was the main thing we're doing there. Now, what are we actually going to be learning in this class? Well, as I said, everything is on that piece of paper. But you want to think of it as two sets of stuff. We're going to learn a bunch of definitions. And we're going to learn what I might call principles, rules, or laws. What's the fundamental difference between these two? Uh, one way to think about it is a definition something that you can, whoops, you can always use a definition. But it is not always useful. And that's something you have to keep in mind. So we'll see that a lot. Now, principles, rules, and laws are obviously the opposite of that. You cannot always use. You need a reason. And we'll see how that works. But they're generally the most useful when you pick the right one. And that's really the heart of problem solving in physics. It's asking yourself which of these applies to the situation I'm doing. And when people say I'm having trouble with physics or I have trouble with the concepts, what they're really having trouble with are when to apply these. When do they work? When am I able to use them? Hopefully this you just memorize and accept. You have to. This, this you just have to accept because that's what a definition is. We've just defined it that way. There's nothing really there to understand. We could have defined it a different way, but we chose not to. But the principles and the laws and those other things, they come fundamentally from experiments. And if you really want to ask the question, why is it true, it's true because experiments show it's true. And that's, that's just kind of the first level of acceptance. We wouldn't be doing it if it didn't actually work. Now, this is where it really comes down to in that strategy part, right? Doing something for a reason. Why do you have those? So let's, let's compare these two real briefly. And I'm going to give you a definition that we might see very soon. 
And the definition of velocity, anyone remember from back in their youth when they, the few, like five of you who took physics, what velocity is? Meters per second is a good way to start, but if we want to be a little fancier and use calculus. Displacement over time, better, but again, let's get real fancy and use our calculus. Yeah, but you're still not using my calculus. Integral of acceleration, way too complicated, but I like it. <laughs> Correct. Derivative of position or distance or displacement with respect to time. So dx dt. <clears throat> and this is why I love math, because I don't have to write a lot of words I can't spell. Right? I just write my short symbol. Now, you can always use that to find velocity, except for one small problem. It's the definition. It always works. <clears throat> but you better have position as a function of time, or you can't take its derivative. That's just the way it happens, right? And in fact, that means you need it as a function of time. If I tell you my position now is 2 meters, what's my velocity? You better say, I don't know. Because I don't have anything I can take a derivative of. I just have my one point. Now, in contrast, we have a concept that we'll learn about <coughs> called kinetic energy. Now, this is kind of an interesting one. It is also a definition in its own way. It's 1 half mv squared. It's a slightly different definition because it's a definition of kinetic energy, not of velocity. But it means if kinetic energy is a concept we're able to use, we can now use it to find velocity. It's one of our other ways of finding velocity. And another good way to approach this course is that sheet I gave you, again, are all the formulas and concepts you need. What is one of the most common questions we'll have? You look at the problems. We're going to ask you where something is, how is it moving, what's its velocity, is it accelerating or not? Pretty much those are the only things you want to know about stuff. Where are they, how are they moving, and did they hit someone? And so you're going to want to keep track of all the different ways you could possibly find where something is, how is it moving, velocity, and its acceleration. And already we have two of them. And that is how you'll approach it. Can I use the definition? Can I use some other concept? Any questions on that basic idea? We're about to practice it. So let's take another concept. Energy is, oh wait, sorry, energy of a system is conserved if the work is zero. Notice a very useful word to watch for is the word if. That tells us there's a condition here. We can only use this under a certain re reason or situation. So let's go to clicker question number two. If you're faced with a physics problem, now I know I wrote the definition real fast and I removed it, but you all memorized it, I know, in that 30 seconds. If I'm going to use conservation of energy to solve a problem, I must first know the system in question the work done on the system, that the work on the system is zero, all of the above, only two of the above. Let's see what we got. Interesting. Only two of the above are needed is what a lot of people went for. What I want you to do, we'll do this a bunch in the class, about half of you think it's two of the above, half of you think it's something else. Odds are somebody next to you disagrees with you. Point out why they're an idiot. I mean, Politely discuss why they might be wrong and you're correct. OK. The uh, E's convinced a few people. So it increased a little. Let's see what I cleverly thought. Um, now, oh, yeah, all oh, this is horrible. Aren't you glad there's no multiple choice on the test? Uh, I, I, I overheard a little bit what people are saying. Notice, this is not really a logic puzzle. We're not taking logic and philosophy 3A. This is physics 3A. And 
You need to know the system. If you don't know the system, you don't know what you're doing. You need to know the work done or you can't determine if it's zero. And you need to know it's zero or energy's not conserved. It really is all three go into it. I mean, yes, you might want to have a deep philosophical debate that C includes B because if you know it's zero, you know the work. But the problem is a lot of people when doing physics skip that step. They skip checking what the work is and they think they know it's zero without being really careful to think about what the work is. And that's why I actually separate the two. Because you have to be that kind of anal when you're doing physics. And really check each step carefully. Now, we have one final clicker question, which I will start. So I, I forgot to bring my tennis ball with me today. So I'll just kill the microphone. <laughs> Um, so I'll throw up my pen. I throw up my pen at the top is the acceleration of the pen or ball at the top just before it comes down, non-zero and up, non-zero and down, zero, or you don't have enough information. Okay. 71% of you are wrong. Yay! I do this at the beginning of every class. Well, I'm actually not the beginning of every class, at the beginning of the course. For one very important reason. Your intuition will sometimes kill you in this class. Whether you believe it or not, the acceleration of an object at the top of the throw is still the acceleration due to gravity. And it is non-zero and it's down. By definition, we will learn acceleration means you have a change in velocity. The velocity at the top of the throw does become zero. It stops at the top. If its acceleration is also zero, meaning its velocity cannot change, what would it do? It would just float up there. Because its velocity would be zero and its acceleration would be zero. This is one of those things where you have to take the definitions as I give them to you in this course incredibly seriously. We use them in a very, very particular way. And if you go with your gut instinct, you will be wrong. Now. That being said, there are a lot of things where your gut instinct is correct. You happen to live in the real world, most of you, and physics describes the real world. So it does work, but you have to be very careful to match your experience with the words we use. So Wednesday we get real serious. Take that pre-quiz before Wednesday, read the book, and we'll see you Wednesday.